and um, what a great day. You know what, um, on the last day of every workshop, everyone is always like, oh no, I need to catch my flight. But in the last day of this workshop, I'm like, can we have more of these? Um, great ideas, uh, great exchange, be it in the room or the people online. I was really impressed how the people online went on their own, different rooms, come up with different approach, came and presented in the room here with this Sam, and we'll continue building towards that. I wish we could do this every day, but the good thing is that our relationship is not ending now, we'll continue building. This afternoon, I told you that this workshop is full of a lot of surprises and great people. Um, this afternoon, we are honored. When I say honored, I mean honored to have with us two great researchers, people with a heart for community, and I have a long history of working with communities, working with marginalized population. We heard from Friday up to today, this morning, I want to talk when we heard from the Vice President of the Public Health Agency of Canada, the importance of unconventional data or ensuring that voices of people in communities where we normally do not get data are included in the data that we have. And that the approach that we used is based on the knowledge from communities. We equally heard how the CIHR is moving towards working with organizations like the IDRC to fund work, to look at different ways of reaching out to communities that they do not reach out to or working with countries abroad to ensure that we fight as a global issue. Now we will start today and we'll hear from two great persons that have a history of working with these communities and working with international organization as well as countries and policymakers abroad. If, um, with me today we have um, Mrs. Shitali Singha, who is a senior program specialist with the Global Health Division at the Canada's International Development Research Centre. We heard about ideas mentioned throughout this morning because they do great work. With 20 years of experience with research for development in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean, as well as Middle East. My God. Okay, her areas of expertise include global health, health system strengthening, sexual and reproductive health and rights, digital innovation, health information system, feminist research, and gender analysis, and translating knowledge to maximize potential for large scale positive change. Stanley holds a master's degree in international affairs and a bachelor's degree in management information system. Please just put it together for Stanley, please. Thank you very much. Our next panelist is Professor Aluwalia, who is a seasoned, trained, qualified physician and a health system policy and management specialist. In his current job as the CEO of Higher Health, you hear a lot about Higher Health. They, they do a lot with communities. The organization, which uh, he looks, in, the organization looks into health and wellness and development needs of all public universities technical colleges, vocational colleges, community colleges, private higher education institutions, work and skill-based learning institutions across South Africa. They work with communities, ensuring that they build capacity within university to do the work they're doing, going to community and creating courses in the universities that are meant to help people in local communities, the ones we have been talking about, where we need to survey diseases. Thank you for what you do. The organization has over 70 district-based offices, monitored under regional offices established in Johannesburg, Durban, and Cape Town, centrally operated from its national office in Pretoria. He is a professor actually uh, also at the University of Johannesburg, and he is part of the National Tax Force on COVID-19, mental health, HIV, tuberculosis, GBV, disability, drugs, addiction, and national health insurance. Please, let's put it together for, uh, for Professor Ramnik. Thank you for accepting to do this, and thank you for asking to be part of this, being generous enough to come and share your knowledge with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, my first question will go to uh, Mrs. Shali, uh, and I will ask, to what extent did the politics of data sharing impede policies during the pandemic? As a follow-up to that, I would like to know, but you can break this down. Do you consider this 
as, a, uh, as an exceptional case given the spread and uh, um, given the speed and spread of social media, diversity politics or both? What role can funding agencies play in solving this as we work towards building novel earlier warning framework? Thank you, Jude. Thank you for the warm introduction and for the multi barreled question. I always love those. Um, <clears throat> let me start by saying, pardon my voice, I'm just uh, recovering from a flu, so bear with me. Um, and thank you for inviting me to this excellent conference. I've been able to drop in from time to time, and I've been to a few hybrid conferences, and you know, they're kind of hit and miss, but I think this one has, has been really great in getting people to participate. In. Um, so your question, uh, your first question about the politics of data sharing, I think I would uh, break that apart too and talk a, a little bit about the data, but then the underlying politics around uh, for, around the people from whom from whom you're collecting the data. So we, starting with the data, of course, we've all heard the, the the phrases that data is the new gold or it's the new oil, and clearly it's very valuable. And we are definitely moving towards more open data systems, more open data science, which is all excellent, but data is still, um, it's still associated with the power that people have to hold the data, to analyze it, to present it in ways that could perpetuate the existing power dynamics that are in place. And when thinking about early warning systems, whether it's public health or, or others, it, the data that's gathered is it's about people. It's about people's experiences and people's access to services, their ability to exercise their rights, the level of trust that they have in different institutions that are collecting the data, using the data. These are all fundamentally linked to politics and policy. So definitely the, the politics of, of data during the, the ongoing pandemic is, is very uh, clear, but I would say that when it comes down to data sharing, uh, when, it, when it comes to COVID, I think it's also the nature of COVID as, as, um, as a disease that's important to discuss because it's a little bit of an equal opportunity virus. So it, this has disrupted really a lot of deeply entrenched power structures and structural inequalities that have been there historically. So this virus is affecting everyone, as we know. And it doesn't mean that the people who are more vulnerable didn't experience it more harshly than others. But because the people who have access to data and to media and to policymakers and to politicians. So we are losing you a little bit. I think the oh, sound, can you, are you about to hear very well? Is this? Can you, can you speak again? Let me see if it's okay. Earlier on, it was break. We lost you at some point after you talk about politics and then you move on to nature of the pandemic talk about COVID being the nature of the pandemic and then you were expatiating on that then I, we lost you the sound quality was not good enough okay why um mrs chitali joined us back chitali joined us back i want i'd like to move to professor ramnik and uh, chitali was talking about the nature of COVID 19. oh she's back okay thank you can you hear me better now can you hear very well i think there is something is the problem from her or from the room here? Uh, no, it's um, from uh, our, our speaker. Okay, I'll, I'll keep talking. Can you hear me? It's still no. breaking, but we can manage because throughout it was really manageable. I thought the problem was from the speakers here, but I've just been informed by my very good friend Zara that it's not from the speaker. Okay. Your voice, your voice breaks, so just uh, just keep it closer to the mic. Okay, thank you. I'll try that. Is is this better? Yes. yes. I'll, better. I'll, I'll keep talking, and if it's not, just let me know. How's that? Okay. Um, so I I think Jude, what I was um, saying was that the, the the nature of the virus and the way it's uh, affecting everyone, regardless of your your level of power or your access to resources, has also played into the data, the politics of the data. Um, so. Yes, I do acknowledge the role of social media has, it has been significant in the pandemic and it has been in all aspects of our lives. So it's a little bit of a, a backdrop for everything that we experience. And I think in the case of COVID, it also pointed to us that no, we can't rely on just medical data 
or um, you know, weather data or crop data or things like that, but we need to look at social data. So data around schools being closed, around labor dynamics, around the impact of lockdowns that are having on people's lives and livelihoods, because it did affect everyone. It, it shocked people's fundamental being and the way in which they lived. And this also influences looking at social relations and gender dynamics. And this is something that Stephen and Marissa and others have, have discussed, that, that intersectional nature of that power of data to unpack things that we hadn't seen before. Um, so maybe that answers a little bit your, your second question about the speed and the spread of, of um, social media and how it has played a role. And I think in uh, your third question was about the role of a funding agency. And um, for those who don't know about IDRC, the International Development Research Centre, we are a crown corporation, which means we're a part of the government of Canada. Um, and we do report to the to a minister within within Canada's government, but we do also have our own distinct board of governors. And our mandate is slightly different in the sense that our mandate is to work more closely with researchers and implementers in the countries where challenges are being faced. So in low and middle income countries. And um, so as a funding agency, when I think about strengthening early warning systems, I think. Uh, and we do look not just at the, the system as a product in the end or the data and the data points and where it's coming from, but really making sure that the systems are not being developed in a vacuum of understanding the, people's, the people that it's supposed to represent. And um, looking at that intersectionality point that uh, Stephen Hoffman mentioned, and making sure that the design is being done by the people who live in the countries where, where these issues are being experienced. And I'm very interested to hear from Professor Ramnik about his, about his role and the role of his organization in strengthening not just early warning systems, but all of the supporting structures that are needed for those systems to be developed. You need, you need higher education, you need networks among these educational institutions. You need to have in, um, models to incubate on, on entrepreneurs that look at private sector. And it's not just about one, one thing is gonna solve everything. You need the modelers, you need the social scientists, you need the policy experts, and you need the integrators to work among them. So I would say IDRC feels like all of those are important. And the most important thing is to look at it in a, in a de decolonial way. So not about taking a model that's wor worked elsewhere, even if it's within the same continent, but really looking at what is needed there, taking parts that work, sharing with one another, but making sure that what is built is credible and will be used. Because we've seen time and time again, and especially in this ongoing pandemic, it's that if the data is not trusted, it can actually do more harm than good. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Oh God, I love the idea. See, the colonial approach, locally made by the people in the area that's been affected. You don't sit here and understand the problems that people face in the community with other people. So Ramnik, um, this is a very great conversation that uh, Shitali just raised. And I want you to continue from there to say, what has we learned from the global COVID-19 pandemic um, regarding multiple scale governance failure to protect the most vulnerable? She tell spoke clearly around ensuring that's locally relevant. What have we learned? Can you add to some of the things that we have learned from COVID-19? All right, uh, um, I just wanted to check if I'm audible and greetings to you, Jude. Um, you. And greetings to you, Dr. Sanan. It's fantastic listening to you. And greetings to everyone who's listening to me. Um, it's nine o'clock at night here in South Africa. And good afternoon to all of you. Um, and, um, but you, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, uh, COVID-19 COVID pandemic has been a, quite an eye-opener to the global world. Um, the, we, you, we live in global south and you live in global north. And we thought uh, we're two different continents and two different worlds. But I think this pandemic brought us together. And I think that uh, answers a bit of your multi-scale governance failures. Now, what has happened is um, Africa being a poor continent, um, unfortunately, uh, predominantly youth continent with an average age group of 18 years old. Um, and then suddenly uh, this pandemic, when it started 
uh, emerging globally um, and started killing people considering the fact that it's, a, it's an airborne disease and it spreads quite quickly between one human to the other. What the global north forgot or the scientific, scientific world forgot was, uh, and vaccine is a great, a great example to explain, is that they started storing vaccines in Canada, they started storing vaccines in UK, in the United States, in Europe, in many parts of the rich world, which is rightfully for their own population. But what they forgot about was it's a virus, it's a microorganism, and it mutates, which means it doesn't need a boundary to mutate. Uh, with this current world where there is cross-migration of population in extreme uh, situations of where global south, south and global north or the developing or the developed world is interconnected, the virus will move and virus will move very quickly. And that's exactly what happened. What happened was a population like Africa with only when, when, when say Canada or UK were about 70% of the population being vaccinated, uh, Africa was sitting only at 10% which means 90% of human bodies had no immune response and giving a free flow to the virus to mutate. And that's what virus wants. What the virus will do is if a virus finds an immune system where the immune system overpowers the virus, the virus does not, does not get the hiding place in a human body and mutate. A virus needs immunocompromised bodies. It needs less of immune system. And I think all vaccines we're doing was in boosting our immune system. And that's a multi-governance failure. A multi-governance failure where the same global north could have understood the reality that vaccinating with equity to everyone would save the world and do not let this virus enjoy the free flow of mutations. And we, we, we're only achieving that status now with either uh, lots of humans who, who probably uh, produce something called uh, acquired immunity, and they are now, without vaccination, being able to resist this virus mutations. However, the virus is still mutating quite, quite uh, extensively, uh, but not to the level that we saw in the past, uh, because we're still seeing the same Omicron variant being, being the one which is still in domination and producing subvariants, which brings some light that at least there's no new to variant in the world. But what the world needs to understand with Ebola that's, that's, uh, that's that still exists around us. It's still confined to a localized community so far in Africa, but the mutations will not stop for a virus. It's a matter of time when the same virus can, can go cross migration, produce its um, content towards, uh, towards what exactly what we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is a, a start to what the world has experienced with climate change, the world is experiencing with, with population growth, world is seeing with, 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 with ginormous amount of, of, of different um, 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 uh, in, influencing, environmental influencing conditions, allowing the viruses to now uh, come to light. Though they have always been existent, it's just that our human growth, our climate change is now allowing uh, what we are going to face as a human survival. And I think that's where uh, data from Global South and Global North together is critical. Uh, development of common research programs, a sharing of data, working together, putting a center of excellence both in Global South and Global North. We are living as humans as together. We are all interdependent. In, we, in what's going to affect Canada is a matter of time it will affect South Africa. What starts in DRC will affect South Africa maybe closer than you, but you're not far away. So I think uh, what, what the COVID-19 pandemic and our multi-governance failures have has asked the scientific world to now group together, uh, sharing of data, bring communities together, bring policymakers together, whichever country, and I'm South Africa is a proud nation to inform that, where we could, and I'm higher health is a great example, where we could bring the policymakers far earlier together with the scientific world get the data to understand from the, from the governance perspective and put laws and policies far more quicker are those countries that have been able to save lives. Uh, they've not been able to save the, the immune system not developing, but they could give good time for the immune system to develop and let less human lives to die. But whereas systems where the political world, uh, the governance systems world, the communities and the scientific world were isolated, 
and I'm sorry to say many developed world in the same world, uh, there the segregation or isolation of work together actually cause more havoc or more challenges. So I think there's a lot of multi-governance failures for us to discuss. Uh, one is intercontinental discussions together, groupings of, of, of work together, not working in isolation, a, a wake up call for policymakers, one of one, I am one of them to tell you that you need scientific people to also now become policymakers, understand the scientific world, bridge the relationship between policymakers, and it's especially the world, world community. Without community, you will not get ethical data. And if you do not get ethical data, your data is meaningless. And I agree with Dr. Sinha. Sometimes data can be more harmful for the scientific world if it's too aggressive in collecting your data by pushing the community without understanding what you're doing. But getting a buy-in with them, working together with them, working with policymakers. So I think COVID-19 is a wake-up call. We're sitting with many more viruses and bacteria around us. Uh, those wake-up calls are going to come quite frequently. And I think it's uh, it's something for, and I think it's Jude, what you're doing, bring the IDRC, South Africa, yourself, that's what we need. And come up with consensus to say, we're going to fight maybe the next pandemic far more resilient, better, and efficient, and learn from each other rather than the way we did in COVID-19. Thank you. Vaccine nationalism, bad, dangerous. Um, working in silos, bad. Really, really bad. I really love that you touched some of these key things and moving towards the approach that the IDS is uh, working with academic to build in the global south, where you decolonize research, have local people work on tools, learn from each other, make regular and work together. That's the way forward and that's the approach that we use in South Africa across. I really love that. I want to go back, as you mentioned, talking about working together, creating this partnership. I want to come back to Shitali and ask, how can local governments and private ventures work together following from Professor Ramnick's working together to ensure that broader access of important data to help shape policy and promote more efficient and equitable area warning system is available. Thank you, Jude. And let me start by saying um, it's very kind of Dr. Ramnick to make me a doctor as well. I'm, I'm not a doctor, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Just wanted to clarify that. Um, and, and I, I really liked your point uh, about ethical data, and I hope we have a chance to, to, to discuss that in the, in the conversation later on. Jude, thank you so much for that question. Uh, I think, you know, the role of private sector is undeniable. If we're going to succeed in overcoming any sorts of shock, whether it's a public health shock or other, we, we cannot do it without the private sector. Um, and similarly, uh, look, looking too much to the private sector without understanding the core role of the public sector is also going to land us into deep trouble. So um, I think that, uh, again, this Stephen's talk this morning talked about the bottlenecks that they have been experiencing in Canada in establishing um, certain systems and networks. And it's, it's not the technical stuff. It's normally the governance stuff and the cultural things and the trust. So my generic response to ensuring that uh, governments and private ventures work together, I think starts from open communications and trust, understanding what each party parties bring to the table, what strengths people have, how things can be complemented, not expecting the other parties to necessarily adopt your mandate, they're, they're not going to. They're, they're not going to see the world in the same way you do. But that doesn't mean that the overall objective in terms of making things better, making health systems stronger, making uh, climate uh, adaptation more accessible, whatever that cause might be, that bigger objective, I think, does unite many sectors. But I think where people often get stuck is that you come to the table and you say, well, I can't believe that they don't want to address my strategic objectives of A, B, and C. And so I think that making sure that these conversations happen in, a, in an informed way and people have to come to the table thinking about the bigger goals, recognizing their place as part in the puzzle to make that feasible and being humble about that and being open to having other people join the discussion. I think that is very important. I also think that it's important for these conversations not to just happen at times of a crisis. 
these conversations need to happen all the time. We need to build up this momentum, build these relationships, build the systems, because we want to be able to have anticipatory action um, to a shock, as well as something that just responds. And I think COVID has reminded us that, okay, well, we can do amazing things, like what has happened with the vaccine in terms of its development. Everyone talks about it. It's a great story of collaboration and all of that. It falls apart a little bit when it comes down to vaccine equity and access, as we know. But um, it's just to say that I think that there is a balance in exploring what the technical solutions are when you're looking across sectors, public, private, and third sector. And, you know, there are real things to overcome when it comes to things like intellectual property and it comes to data security and management. They're not, they're not insignificant but they're also not um, insurmountable. And I think that focusing on the, the other governance, cultural, social, kind of coming to the table with that mindset, I think is the foundation to overcome those complex technical issues that, that stand in the way. So I think that having equitable systems really relies on recognizing the strengths that people have and having the humility to see your position in the bigger picture. Thank you. Trust, which is, I love this message that you're bringing here. If building momentum ahead of time, which is the same message Marisa brought in here earlier on, very, very impress, impressive. Um, equitable system. And talk about equitable system, I want to turn over to Ramnik and ask you a question regarding how do you um, can active participation by marginalized communities improve disease surveillance, health protection for all, uh, as well as governance? Important question, Jude. Um, and uh, and and um, I'm going to cite some examples of what what we've achieved and uh, how we've used a partnership with marginalized communities to really improve our first sign of uh, picking. Um, of surveillance or uh, disease improvements, you know, in general. So I'll give you South African context with that with that examples, but uh, but you know, uh, marginalized populations are vulnerable populations. Um, there, it is where uh, the first sign of epidemics or disease surveillance starts. Um, you know, um, and that's what I think the governance failures have been because they are always ignored or they are less resourcely uh, um, in, you know, invested population. And I think that's where we lose the trick as scientists, we lose the trick as policymakers and governance. So I think that's why this question is very relevant. Uh, I think in Canada, you have different kinds of marginalized population, uh, your indigenous populations, your, your uh, African communities that are in Afro-American communities. And there are many more, uh, I would say. But in South Africa, uh, we have a pre-apartheid population, which is a very poor South African population, which is marginalized. Um, poverty is a, is a big driver for many epidemics in general. Uh, the other marginalized population for South Africa or for African continent is young people. The reality is that uh, Africa is a youth continent and, and South Af Africa's median age is 17, and South Africa's median age is 27. So youth plays a very central role. Um, so start with, uh, you all heard of this uh, variant called Delta, which caused a havoc for third waves, second waves, and different parts of the world in fourth waves. It was discovered in South Africa, if you remember. And how was it discovered? It was discovered from a marginalized population through surveillance. Um, and it was us at Higher Health who discovered it. Um, uh, obviously, genomic sequencing then produced the, the, the new variant. So um, higher health is an institution that's responsible for all universities and colleges and South Africa's 80% of the population in post school system, which is community colleges and high schools and is very poor South Africans. And um, <clears throat> when COVID lockdowns happened, we had residences or accommodations where young people reside together. And remember, this pandemic was always known to be an old man's disease or an old people's pandemic because that's, that's the most vulnerable population to death for COVID-19. But the spread of the population is more from the young people. 
because the virus will quickly find a joy if it finds another human body and youth allows that. So which means we had to put surveillance in young people to catch the disease early. The first time we saw after a second wave finished, which was due to the beta variant, and there was a huge period of silence and the lockdowns were locked, were easing down, the economy was started coming back, and suddenly we found 100 young students becoming positive in one residence in one of our university. And that was an alarm to us immediately to say, suddenly something has changed drastically that 100 people have been suddenly positive. And it's the first day it was 40, the next day it was 100, third day it was 1,200, fourth, it was moving like wildfire. We sent the samples straight to the genomic sequencing and there we found a variant sitting, absolutely mutated to a more vulnerable or a volatile variant or something which was, we call it as, um, uh, 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 what is the word, in, more infectious uh, variant in the world called Delta, which caused havoc all over the world. Now, if we didn't pick this up early or surveillance would have not picked it or, or somebody would have not alerted from the first signs of warning that there is something unusual for the scientific world to wake up, we could have been in far difficult scenarios. Policymakers would have never put the lockdown in positions back. Uh, that, that time we didn't have any vaccine, so we had no immune systems into the level that we needed an immune system for any herd immunity, et cetera. So these are early signs from marginalized communities. So marginalized communities should not be only um, uh, uh, low population communities or populations which are uh, 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 poor or, or small in numbers, uh, marginalized populations are populations that are vulnerable. And vulnerable can be even the, the majority. According to me in Canada, your aging population is a marginalized population, vulnerable population. How do you define a scientific world is your terminology on marginalized. But in marginalized populations, we believe in vulnerabilities quite, quite deeply. So I just thought of, of citing that example. Now, how did we pick the 100? Is because our policymakers, um, it was uh, Higher Health being an agency of the South African government, um, me as being a CEO, could meet the minister very easily, bring this group of scientists to the minister in, in a close proximity, and tell the minister, see, minister, we have a policy to be developed very quickly. It was the first case in South Africa was detected on 8th of March. We had a policy on the 15th of April on COVID-19 in the country. On the 25th of April, uh, 25th of May, which is one and a half month, we developed an AI tool, an artificial intelligence tool called HealthCheck. It was a, a green passport system. We knew we cannot lock our in communities. We didn't have the infrastructure for education system or economic system to continue without not opening our economy. We knew we had to open our economy despite the pandemic pushes up to a, on, on the back foot. We cannot have queues of people standing on the gates of institutions of learning and schools and in economic spheres and private sector and waiting for their uh, screening. We didn't have the money to put $20 billion to, to hire more nurses or more screeners and train them, put them suits and screen people to open the economy. The only thing we could use is a, is a technology. So uh, technology came in existence, the policymakers existed, scientific data quickly said that screenings can be done on telephone, uh, on USSD, on WhatsApp, on smartphones. People have access to these things. In one minute, in, 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 in one month of announcement of the policymakers agreement with the scientific data, we had this artificial intelligence launched and this technology was already enrolling about 1.6 million people on the system. Daily health checks were being done. What this was happening was we were using the same for issuing green passport, but we are using the same mechanism for data surveillance. We had consented because of an epidemic of this kind, policymakers can through scientific world put ethical data considerations towards more ethics approvals, faster mechanism of surveillance and data usage for policy governance. And that can happen and that should happen. And that's exactly what happened. This 100 people that we identified were symptoms of, 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 of small, young people will never show high symptoms. They're only the signs that you have to pick up from early data understanding of surveillance, from something like the AI 
or the intelligence tools or tools that we deploy in our community. But and alone a policymaker or a scientific world will not achieve this if the communities don't buy in. You needed 1.7 million people to, to agree with you, to believe in what, what the policymakers, the scientific world is saying. And that needs consultation, that needs painful exercise, that needs time, that needs good communication, that needs being in the community and engaging right from a vice chancellor, which is your president in the university, down to a security officer in the institution. Same applies to school, same applies to to any community in the private sector with the CEO right to the people. And that can sometimes be achieved. COVID-19 is a great example. Uh, we are a good example. Our dashboard is live on websites. You can see it clearly, how many people took uh, uh, surveillance data into the system, how many people believed in the surveillance data, how many gave the data. We tested our vaccination system through that. Uh, what communities wanted, how they wanted the vaccine program, what kind of vaccine program would they like? Uh, so you cannot impose implementation or program programs guided by the scientific data without not having the communities buy in. Communities need to tell you what they need so that the scientific data can speak to, to what the communities want. And there's a merriness between the two worlds for achieving high implementation goals. So I think um, <clears throat> there's a lot of le lessons learned and marginalized communities are very critical for buy in support, good communication with them, policymakers, scientific data world to come and work with them. Uh, they will, it's, it's non-ethical to force communities to give data. It's ethical to communicate with them, talk to them and ask them why. Uh, every population wants to protect their lives. They need to understand why they need to be protecting their lives. Young people were the most difficult to convince in giving us the data because that data was where the early signs would have been picked for any disease spread. And that's exactly what South Africa used. South Africa won because we saw young people as a source, not only for a high population spread, but also a population with early signs of surveillance. And sometimes your worst enemy can be your best result giver. And I think that's the message I would give you. So you have to think out wow. of the box and make, make it happen. <clears throat> Impressive, wow. Community engagement, uh, community buy-in, nothing about a community without a community. And Ramnik just begged good news, um, something that a lot of us do not know, higher health detected Delta and took it to authorities earlier on. That's surveillance, one successful story of AI solutions. Very, very important. Um, Ramnik, I'm just gonna follow up on that, just bridge away from the plan just to ask you, how the Green Passport get this data every day as we move towards area warning system? How does the Green Passport ensure that you survey the students every day, given that this is, like you mentioned, the young population, South Africa is a very young country, very young talents are the people to actually pay a lot of attention in, but it's always difficult to have access to that data. How do you use the Green, pass, uh, the green Passport? So, uh, as I said, one of the policy intervention was either we put screening stations to get our populations to come in, or we start using artificial intelligence. We quickly developed application system. Uh, you remember we have universities, we got technical, technical universities, we've got so many postdoctoral students sitting with us. We put everything together to start working on a common application under the higher health. So you need a national coordination, put the best minds together in the scientific world with technology, with your service providers, like the private sector, as, as uh, Ms. Sina said, around uh, you need them. And that's what exactly we did. We, in a month, came up with a technology called Health Check, and thanks to Bill Gates Foundation, a very good partner to the South African government. But of course, the majority was our government investment. We came up with this technology. We tested it quite deeply, but within a month, we were ready with the technology that could reach out through USSD, WhatsApp, because people didn't have smartphones, web forms, any formulation, if anyone has one device. What we asked people was, register on this device, on the system. So we didn't want them to register on any application. We wanted a SMS service. So we got them, uh, we, we worked with the cell phone providers to provide free SMS service, free data on that particular WhatsApp numbers. We worked on the web form system where uh, we made our websites data free very, very quickly. So it was a lot of work in one month with a number of a series of interventions. And eventually in a month itself, of the pandemic, we could launch uh, an application system. 
Now this application system wa warranted people to do screening of COVID symptoms. Uh, plus they were also able to give us more data around surveillance that our National Institute of Communicable Diseases or our centers needed in genomic surveillance or system surveillance. And that's what happened was we integrated this system with our country surveillance system. And what we said was, we're gonna start picking data and root into that data. What we were interested was, can we pick up epidemic trends in provinces and districts in local municipalities so that we can alert the authorities far more quicker, send them so that we can curtail the spread, quarantine things quicker, isolate people quicker. That's all our aim was. But they could not enter institutions of work if they did not bring the green passport. So if you were all negative, you get a green passport, you show on the counter and you move in. Remember, uh, any clinician will ask you symptoms. That's all is gonna happen. Why don't you have symptoms right on your desktop in front of your phone early in the morning before even you take a public transport or before you even move towards your workspace? So you do it. Even till today, people do it. And, and a green passport on the gate, a security guard all knows is a date. So it expires in 24 hours. So every day, person who has to choose a public facility has to do the surveillance. And then what happened was the data was linked. And to be very honest, we started classifying uh, populations with mild, medium, and high-risk populations because those who produce red falsely or um, even they didn't want to go to work, say, for example, the surveillance team will reach them very, very quickly. So they were already, already going to be very true because the policymakers have put this into system with scientific data. So more authentic authenticated data started coming into the system. We did ethics approval on this data for surveillance only. Uh, we were not going to use it for research publications, but for surveillance, early science reporting, and straight linking to the National uh, uh, Information Center, where the, the real surveillance was happening. Real surveillance was only happening from hospitals, but we can't wait for hospital data, but that's too late. We need community data. The only way you can have a community data is if you have the community with you. This system got 1.7 million people around the country in one data system. So you can pick trends very quickly. I picked 100 people in a blink of an eye who said they're not going to attend a class in one of our university. Clear sign, there's something wrong very quickly. Surveillance team went, took, took samples, and they were sitting a Delta, sitting in the system. So giving you that perfect example of the green passport system through a policymaker with the buy-in of the community, putting in early signs symptoms of surveillance, so COVID should not be, and I agree with uh, Ms. Sinha, uh, you should be Dr. Sinha, I'm so sorry, uh, 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 Shetali on this one. But what I am trying to say is you're absolutely right. We should not be waiting for COVID for such things. If we know there's a measles outbreak in Johannesburg, we need to be ready. If we know there is uh, uh, malaria is reaching very quickly to New York, so I don't know how far it's from Toronto, but uh, the, 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 the weather change is going to produce these mosquitoes to bring uh, these, uh, these, uh, these, these, uh, these, uh, these, 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 these microorganisms to any part of the world now. You are not as safe as you thought you were. You are not only a disease of non-communicable or cancers or heart attacks. Viruses and bacteria are going to be closer to you as it's closer to us. So um, again, to repeat and reinstate, early signs of surveillance cannot be achieved without a buy-in of a community, without the buy-in of a policymaker. And without, I agree the private sector and government needs to work together, but the scientific world, the policymaker, the private sector and the communities, they are one consortium to fight the world. Without one moving out, you cannot win anything. And this is a good sign because when COVID-19 is easing down and we're waiting for the next epidemic to come, let's get our houses ready and let's have intercontinental work happening. Let Canada and South Africa work together on, on Ebola surveillance on many other measles surveillance, on uh, malaria surveillance. These are not viruses and bacteria far away from you and for us. Thank you. Uh, I heard led to join the Africa Canada Artificial Intelligence and Data Innovation Consortium. I'm glad that I held on board. I'm glad that we believe in nothing about a community without a community buying from government. I really love that. And speaking to the importance of data, which is where my next question will move to, and I'll be asking Stanley as to, do data really help in policymaking? 
does that really help improve decision making for policymakers? Well, I'd, I'd like to really think the answer is a big yes, because that's what IDRC would really hope to be the case. I think, I, I mean, I, I really appreciate the story that um, Dr. Remnik has shared, because I think it really points to the importance of data, but also the way in which it's presented. So we know that that story that we just heard about um, how his institution worked with, with communities and worked with with um, uh, policymakers and things like that. It took data, but it, it wove it into a story. And that I think is, is, is a really great example of how data can improve decision-making. It's, it's, it's not a yes or no, it's, I think it's really about, so it's a, it's a necessary, but definitely not sufficient um, factor to make policymakers do the right thing or do the informed thing, I would say. And things like, trust, credibility, um, positioning and timing and all of those things that you can read in textbooks about knowledge management and, and communications are all very important. And I think that it's, it's about understanding policymaker behavior as well. And I think one of the ways in which we can uh, look inside that black box and not just expect things to happen is involve policymakers right from the beginning and even before something happens. So um, the example that we heard from South Africa is a great example of that. From IRC, um, from the from the work that you are familiar with, um, with the AI for Health and the, the academic and a range of other grants that we do. We, Mrs. Sneha, we are losing you. You're losing me again? Yes, please. Is it okay? Yeah, good. We've got we've got an AI fine now. Yep. I'm so sorry. I don't know what's happening. Um, I think there's an MS Teams Zoom thing because I often have this challenge with Zoom and I, our institution uses MS Teams. But anyway, that's another conspiracy theory we can set aside right now. <laughs> um, I was saying that in integrating policymakers from the design stage is very important. And I think it takes a little bit of the guesswork out of the equation. Not all of it by any means because governments change and policymakers change and all that kind of stuff. But I could say that there was one uh, large program that IDRC supported for over seven years in partnership with the Canadian Institutes for Health Research and Global Affairs Canada, where it was uh, called Innovating for Maternal and Child Health in Africa. And the way in which it was designed was there were actually three PIs. One was African-based researcher, the second was um, a researcher based in Canada, and the third was a policymaker based in Africa. So both of the African PIs were the lead PIs, and the policymaker PI was there right from the beginning, invited to all of the workshops, integrated into all of the thinking, and formed the design of the implement of the intervention. And we saw real policy uptake in places like Nigeria and Mozambique and Tanzania. So. I think that there are things that we can do to make it that, to make the, the policy making process and the, and the path that it takes less of a mystery and try to make it more of, um, more something that we can try to influence by our actions. So I would say that the absence of strong data upon which stories should be built, because stories should obviously be backed up by sound data, credible data, locally generated data. In the absence of data, what I fear is that policymakers still need to make policies. They still need to make decisions. So absolutely, we need to get the data out there. We need to keep it accurate. We need to make sure it's positioned. We also need to recognize that the digital space, as we all know, it's fast evolving. It's, it, you know, it's not even an it. It's just everywhere. And we need to think about the ethics when we're taking data from community members. What, what is it, not just that we're doing, but what is it that we're communicating that we're doing? Because in a lot of contexts that IDRC works, you know, whether it's uh, Guatemala, where there are different refugees and migrants who have reason to distrust the government, or elsewhere where there are just these historical practices in, in, in South Africa and elsewhere where people uh, who are already in positions of vulnerability 
are, are, have good reason to not trust somebody coming to take more of their data, take samples, take do this, do that. So it's, it's putting ourselves beyond what we know is right, getting the IRB approvals, but also recognizing the optics and the way in which our actions are being interpreted by those who, which, who we are trying to work alongside and we're trying to help. And I think all of this, it sounds like a little bit of a departure from asking whether or not data can influence policymakers, but it's all connected, I believe, because the, the quality of the data and, the, and where it comes from and then where it goes in terms of the policymakers, once policies are made, they need to be listened to and adhered to and trusted. So it, 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 I don't think it, it requires fundamental shifts. But I do think that working more collaboratively, working uh, in ways that people don't feel like they're invited to the party late. So policymakers might often feel like that. Oh, well, we're just invited for the unveiling of the results. And although that might be nice, they might feel more compelled to poke holes in what they're seeing. Whereas if they're part of the design, then they're more compelled to understand the complexities and understand why things aren't as perfectly done or done as per was the original plan. So I think that data is essential, but we need to be smart about how we think about data, how we gather the data, and who we involve in the process of designing how we get the data, how we analyze the data, how we position the data, and how we communicate it in terms of stories or tweets or what have you. Like it's it's a it's a whole ecosystem of of data that we need to look at. Oh God, I love this. You don't wait till everything is done and then you go to policymakers and then tell them this is it. You get them from the onset, from the gathering to how it's being used to analyze till before you get to that policy piece, and that's when data becomes very relevant. What a great piece. I, I will now move back to um, you, Ramnik, because you've done a lot of work and I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna repeat something that you have said a lot here, but just to go back to knowing how important data is and bringing policymakers, and I know you inform the minister, you work with all the ministers in South Africa and work with the communities. Um, how, we wanna learn from you, how can surveillance data be collected, managed, and disseminated to all in various contexts to support equity, resilience, and risk mitigation? And how can important data gaps we feel true community participation. You have a lot of experience in this. I know you have said some of these things. No, thank you, uh, Jude. Uh, I think uh, I'll start with uh, Ms. Sinha's comment on this matter. I fully agree with you. I think you got the guru mantra right. The mantra is bring the policymakers and community early before the scientific world starts putting their data into the system. Otherwise the data is meaningless. I think that's a very important point. And that's exactly what I do and what we do as an organization in general. Um, so uh, Jude, I wanted to get to you that data collection has to be an art. It's not a, and specifically from communities, if you're talking about early servants, it's very easy to get it from the health facility, but that's a bit too late of data. And that's not a data that's gonna improve any policy change, except you're gonna work on a hospital policy change or something, not on a disease perspective in general. A uh, disease uh, perspective of policy data changes needs community buying into the system. And data collection from the community is your biggest uh, reason of win and also your biggest challenge. Um, I, I give you again uh, my example. I, I'm not talking about COVID anymore anymore. I think I've spoken a lot about it. Let me now engage the higher health, other business of work. Um, um, HIV, uh, TB, um, unplanned pregnancies in South Africa, teenage pregnancies, a huge problem. Um, and that happens in communities. Uh, gender-based violence, uh, gender equality, the SDGs that we talk about in UN goals of, uh, of many other systems, that falls part of higher health's mandate. Uh, our work, uh, South Africa uh, is, is far um, more open than the African, other African uh, sisters and brothers around us, around the LGBTQI, but still very marginalized communities actually, and very extremely vulnerable. There's a lot of work that we work in that system. Disability, um, we estimate 17% of our population somewhere getting disabled at times. Um, um, and you have a huge uh, threat called security at this moment, you know, gun, for gun violence, and same thing in South Africa. We got a safety issue, civic issues. Uh, so I think these all form part of higher health pillars. So I'm not just 
uh, talking about now COVID. And I'm going to talk about data collection on HIV, data collection from communities on, on, uh, on teenage pregnancies and unplanned pregnancies, and data collection on gender-based violence, the biggest issue for us in South Africa, uh, data collection on mental health diseases. And that's a huge destroyer for us as a continent at this moment. Uh, and I can pick up, uh, okay, I'm going to take up two of the most complicated challenges in South Africa, not a simple, not uh, diseases like HIV and stuff, which we, we know how data can be collected and how we can move into. Now, South Africa, in 2016, I had a meeting uh, with the parliament, and we were in the parliament, and they wanted us to develop a policy on gender-based violence due to the menace it causes into losing human lives. Um, and the effect it has on our economy. Um, and we needed a policy intervention. Uh, it was very clear. But policy intervention cannot happen without data, without scientific understanding. Um, um, you cannot put a, just a policy and say, oh, we're going to fight GBV because we have a GBV policy. GBV policy needs surveillance before. It needs data collection. It needs data understanding. It needs uh, systems around where the baselines are. What we want to achieve, what are the implementation goals in the next five years? What will be our next goals in 10 years? You cannot do if you don't have baselines, you don't understand. And that's what we did. It took us to study data since 1970, archived in our publications first. Go to historical data, bring it back if you want to write a policy. We looked at our recent surveys and put up surveys together to start understanding what is the situation of gender-based violence in a system. Then we started, then the, when the scientific world stopped with its data, both from historic and from the current data to get a baseline, it took us five years to consult that data, consult with communities. How do we put a policy if the communities don't buy into the policy? What are we trying to achieve from a GVV policy? One, we want to break the silence. We want, if our data says only one in 10 South Africans report cases of GVV, nine do not and suffer, and that's key, killing our economy, then we need the nine to report early. So early interventions can happen. Early care can be put together. Early uh, domestic partner violence or system violence can be stopped and economy can be preserved. That's what we're trying to achieve if you, if you break down the problem child from data. And that can only happen if the communities understand what we're trying to achieve. So five years, so a sci so scientific world needs to first understand how to collect data and evaluate data, but then be patient with policymakers and governance to engage communities in their buying. And that's how a policy becomes implementable or actionable. Now, in order to collect the data, because your question is, how do we collect data? And I, I'm sorry, I deviated away and I bring back my answer to it. Higher health uses a very innovative way of collecting data. And that's through education system. Uh, we have a curriculum called a civic and health curriculum. But again, I used data and policymaker to parts of policy to say, this is an important curriculum for this country's high school students, institutions of higher learning, community education, where the youth is. In order for us to bring education as prevention and early interventions to them. <clears throat> But due, due, with the curriculum, we have started putting risk assessments of diseases. So if they understand a module called HIV, which is so predominant in South Africa that we want every young South African to know HIV. And because in order to teach every young South African of a disease called HIV, we end up collecting data while teaching uh, the young people. 750,000 young South Africans every year join the higher health curriculum, 750,000 voluntarily as part of an extra qualification. That's the incentive we give them. Learn civic values and health at early stages of your life. They join it. And in return, they consent to our data. But we use that data for surveillance and early intervention. So should we find an indicator in an individual number one, which is, uh, which is which is a, uh, which is a, um, a, a unique identifying data, which is identifying a human, it's linked straight to care focus. So you pick up a risk after the course, they do risk assessment, they link to care. That's our main aim. 
But if they consent, we use um, um, anonymous data then together for policy governance. That what are the trends we are picking in the country? Say for BMI, body mass index and diabetes. We last two years back, we picked up, sorry, before the pandemic, our 700,000 data started telling us that one in 10 South Africans before the age of 21 are hypertensive. That's a big sign for us to pick, you know? We started really putting a policy thinking into the ground. What's happening here? You know, we, start, we knew uh, the, the, the obesity pandemic is there, but uh, hypertensive pandemics coming so closer to the age of 21 is a, is a wake up call. Now we started seeing trends of diabetes before the age of 25 now, quite quickly into, the, into our system through the surveillance data. We are seeing surveillance data in terms of picking up trends on mental health. That's how we are early identifying what are, the, what are the signs and symptoms into understanding of mental health in early stage? We all know 75% of cases of mental health are before the age of 25. And, uh, and, 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 and it's, it's predominantly the first age of onset is before 15. So how do we put early surveillance towards picking that youth age group so the early interventions can be put together? But what are those early interventions? That can only be come out through data through understanding of what we need to put in place for the community. You can't just randomly say, we'll put an app and uh, we'll put technology to it, or we'll teach mental health and they'll be sorted out. It's not gonna work like that. You need proper data, proper understanding of what risk is coming up. What are the early stresses in South Africa that lead a person vulnerable to mental health to quickly fall into a mental health epidemic? And then you design a, a, an intervention and pilot it with a subgroup of population. So. I'm lucky that I've got a policymaker, I've got scientific world together, I've got universities with me, and we put very quick surveillance systems together for pandemics that affect our country, um, nationally, centrally coordinated to every system in, in every district in the world. So we get huge amount of population from every corner of South Africa, uh, especially a population that affects this economy, which is youth. And so we, we put, so my job is youth surveillance. And, picking signs from the youth data. So all diseases affecting the youth fall under my category of work. Similarly, there are institutions that will be working with old age groups and they should be, do you understand me? And they should find mechanisms of how to reach data collection from the old people, whether it's old age homes, whether it's uh, a fam uh, uh, through so social media platforms, you could, you're gonna be innovative to find. I have an innovation called curriculum and incentivized curriculum that gives you a qualification or certification. People love it. People join it and end up giving us. So, and a million population is enough which you segregate all over the country in order to start picking early signs or symptoms. So I think data collection is an art. It's, it, you have to be out of the box thinking. Facebook and Twitter are not just the answer. Everybody thinks water sanitation is a great answer because people have started using um, um, you know, that's the kind of thinking which is out of the box. You know, how are you going to find surveillance from the community data system? But getting a buy-in from the community and asking community to, uh, in a, to work with the scientific world in giving you data is the best ethical way of doing the work. It takes time, it's patience, it's, it's hard work, but it's the most rewarding because once put, it's permanent. So I think uh, I would advise no shortcuts in data collection. The hard way Take time, build your uh, community system strengthening, work with them, work with the policymaker, make scientific world believe them and they believe you. It's hard, as I said, it took me six years to get one policy intervention after data collection. And today I can tell you, you can see, I can show you one impact result. We had 180,000 young people admitted into the GBV curriculum uh, under our gender studies, uh, 80,000 of them uh, consented on early risk data assessments on their domestic partner violence or their, uh, their, their, their situation in life. For the first time, South Africa saw 8,000 people uh, reporting gender-based violence from hundreds. That's how the impact is seen from community. From 162 to 8,000 in one year, that's your policy implementation. And that comes through consent and trust and belief. And that cannot be achieved it through a Facebook or Twitter in a short -term scenario that we will collect data through that system. It's not gonna happen. It's hard, it's to be with the community then put system. Um, and so data collection needs to be system strengthening. 
and community system strengthening. And that's the fruitful data that will benefit the country, the scientific community, the publications that are coming out, the future world, our legacies to our future population. And I think that's the only advice I can give at this point. Thank you. Thank you. No shortcut, stakeholder engagement, not as an add-on when the project is already going, but from the onset when you're building with that. I will now turn to the room here, the people online, if they have some questions for our guests. It's been an engaging conversation that even forget, look at the time because it's so engaging. <laughs> I was just going. Um, do we have any questions from the room here or from online? Jolene, were you monitoring online for us? Uh, yes, there's no questions. Okay, good. Uh, so we have spent more than one hour. So uh, I would like us to thank our panelists who have actually shared a lot with us. We'll reach back to them with feedback. And if you have any information, you want to reach out to them, please do let us know or we'll share the information with them. Please, let's give it together for them. Thank you.